Let's uh, dive more into tonight's game. T- uh, very pivotal game. Five in Toronto. Michael Grange covers the Raptors, Sportsnet Canada, and he's with us now on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline as the Raptors steal one in Philly the other day, Michael. And, you know, I want to get your take on this team, and you've been around this team for a couple of years, the DeRozan, Lowry-led teams, and how this team is different, and are you seeing that in this playoffs? Because before it just was, ah, they'll find a way to lose. Is this mentality 2-2 in the series with Kawhi Leonard, do you sense that it is different? I think it's different because of Kawhi Leonard. Um, I think they've been in this situation before several times, and typically, you know, they're looking for DeMar DeRozan to do some of the stuff that Kawhi Leonard's done. And uh, more often than not, DeRozan would come up a bit short, or Kyrie Kyrie Irving, Kyle Lowry would come up a bit short, and and the team would come up a bit short. Um, So I think it's really not all that much more complicated than that. I mean, you have a guy who's playing at historic levels, and it's going to get you over the hump in games that you probably don't deserve to win. And I would say game four might qualify as a game that, I wouldn't say you didn't deserve to win, but you certainly, you know, you, you look at how it broke down and it would have been an easy one to lose. And uh, that, guy, that guy got you over the hump. And um, so I think having the confidence that you have that guy is huge. And, you know, the next step there is, is I do think at some point, and we saw some signs of it in game four, some of the, you know, secondary characters are going to play more to their potential and, and the whole team should play a little better. But I'm sure I'm sure the Sixers could say the same thing about some of their guys. No doubt. Um, now, Michael, uh, in Game Four, Nick Nurse, you know, he commented on going with Serge Ibaka and Marcus Saul more, and that they hadn't done all, that all that much. And you've been around the team a lot more. How did you think that that changed the dynamics of Game Four? Uh, you know, that Philly had what gave Philly some troubles from your perspective with that lineup out there. It was just very old school basketball. You know, it was, uh, you know, you talk about Tobias Harris. I heard you guys talking off the top. A lot of times it was Serge Ibaka trying to chase him around. He did have a lot of looks. That's not Serge's strength, if it ever was, is, is guarding guys on the perimeter out in space like that. But if the Sixers aren't making the Raptors pay, um, then you do have a big, pretty physical, really good shot blocking guy alongside another seven foot 300 pounder in a game that turned into like two rats in a sack, right? Like it was, it was not a pretty basketball game. It was, it was an exciting game. It was very compelling because exact, you know, we've all maybe been in those games on a playground where it's just, you know, it's one inch from a fight and that's how it felt. That's how it looked. And Serge Ibaka, you know, he, he was maybe the reason the Raptors got over the top because he, not even some of the rebounds he got, but just, just, tap backs and keeping a ball alive for the next guy and, um, you know, coming back and intimidating on some shots. And, and, you know, when possessions are that tightly contested, um, sometimes that's what makes the difference. And uh, it's maybe not a great formula for a game that's going to run up and down or for an 80-game regular season. But for that game, that moment, those conditions, it was the right move. What do you think the difference maker has been so far in this series? Like from the Toronto side of the fence, are you looking at it like Kawhi's the difference and we don't believe in the Sixers? Or is it like, man, we're escaping these games with the uh, Embiid unreliability and Tobias and other factors? I don't think either team, first of all, there's no difference. Like it's 2-2 <laughs> and, you know, and each, yeah. you know, each team's probably had – a game they thought they played really well, and for sure. They're, you know, each team's won a game they played great, and each team has uh, won a game when they haven't played so great. Um, and and so I don't. I think the teams are very very close, and I think on each side. I mean, certainly the Raptors have to be like whatever issue Joel Embiid has got with his immune system. I mean, the Raptors got to be pretty happy about it because uh, the one game each of them were healthy. Um, you know, he was awesome. And they had no answer. So, uh, you know, so I think they've got to be happy about that. Um, Conversely, I think if you're the Sixers and you're looking at a team like the Raptors that was, you know, number one three-point shooting team in the regular season after they added Marcus All, and they've been anything but that since, 
you got to be feel pretty lucky that nobody's really caught fire and and Siakam is uh, you know he made that stupid move and uh, and you know bruised his calf and and stuff like that. So I think each team can kind of count their blessings a little bit. Um, you know, so I don't I don't really see a big difference between the two teams. I, I at this moment I can still see the series going either way. Um, somebody's going to have to you know play a little bit more to their form to win it, but. Um, you know, I think it's, it's still anyone's, anyone's series. Obviously, it gives the Raptors a little bit of an edge because they have home court. What do you think about the coaching battle so far this series? Has there been any adjustments from the Sixers side and the Raptors side that stick out for you? And then moving forward, are there any adjustments that you can predict or that you think could be crucial for either side to close it out? Well, it's interesting. I mean, here in Toronto, uh, you know, Nick Nurse, first-year NBA head coach, um, he was getting a little heat because I think Brett Brown had him on his heels, right? What The moves they made in Game 2 by um, having Embiid guard Siakam and, and Tobias Harris on Gasol and trying to, you know, force him to use Gasol as a post player, which isn't his preference, those were good moves. And then in Game 3, he kind of toggled back and forth between the different – defensive adjustments and and obviously they won that one too game four yeah i guess you got to give the nod to nick nurse but in some ways his hands were tied right his bench has been terrible um you know they 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 decided to go big with gasol and he basically played six guys so i don't know how much credit a coach gets for just okay i'm just gonna play my six good guys right like uh, i guess we could all do that um i think tonight it's gonna be really interesting to see uh you know what they do I guess the, the primary thing we don't know is, is, is Embiid going to play? Because if Embiid doesn't play, then I think uh, Brett Brown's got to, you know, really start shuffling the deck around. And uh, certainly Ben Simmons would become a much, much bigger factor. I'm sure the pace of the game would pick up. That might help the Raptors. And I think the one thing that the Raptors haven't really gone to yet in, in long stretches um, is, is uh, Kawhi Leonard on Jimmy Butler. They did a little bit down the stretch in game four and it worked and but it's a lot to ask especially you know on you know one day rest after you played 43 minutes Kawhi Leonard has to come out and and play the way he's playing offensively then pick up arguably the Sixers best player on defense so so I think those are things I'm looking for but it really pivots on MB. So Michael there must be an APB out in Toronto on Fred Van Vliet because he's been you know <laughs> an absentee uh bench player here in the series, but that almost from a Philadelphia angle, uh, it almost scares me a little bit. It's almost like, is he a sleeping giant? Is he going to come into this game tonight and finally show up and, and be a big difference? I'm sure that's the big question in Toronto about his play this this series. Well, yeah, there's, there's a couple of things there. One is there is some, you know, Fred Van Vliet is a crowd favorite um, for good reason. He's not like a mascot. Like, he is a guy who's proven himself time and time again, just a tough-minded, competitive guy with a high IQ who figures things out and that's why he's you know survived as long as he has in this league um so the the matchup is not good like he's consistently going against bigger guys and that length I think is maybe bothering him a little bit and there is some question about you know is there something he's had a history of some back problems so maybe he's not at 100 percent and that's hurting him a little bit um but one thing you would say about Van Vliet, he's not one of those guys you just write off. Like, he's just, you just say, listen, this guy's he doesn't have it. And, you know, he is one of the toughest guys mentally I've been around in the league. And so whatever crack of daylight he can find, he's going to burst his way through it. And if it's tight or one night, it could be game seven. I mean, the guy is not scared. So uh, I think there's some legitimate concern on the, on the Sixers side that this guy's not going to be this bad as long as he has been. But, uh, again, it could just come down to a matchup, and it's just the wrong – he's the wrong racehorse for this race. Uh, but they're going to need something out of their very narrow bench and uh, very thin bench, and it's going to be – you know, Ibaka's been decent, uh, certainly wasn't game four. Norm Powell is a guy who has a history of kind of putting his head up at the right time and being a really good – he's had some really big playoff games for this team, and I'm still optimistic he can be a factor. But uh, I would say this, like as great as Kawhi Leonard has been, I think if the Raptors' plan is for him to shoot 63% from the floor uh, with a true shooting percentage of 72 or 73%, which is, you know, I think I saw something the other day that there's only been three players 
to uh, score 35 points a game in a series and average more than 60% from the floor, and it's like Kawhi, Shaq, and Kareem. So I don't think it's sustainable, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, the guy's awesome, and, but if that's the Raptors' formula for winning, I, I, I don't think it's going to work. So right. they're going to need somebody else, Well, and uh, this, someone's going to have to show up. This stat from Kevin Nagandi over at ESPN, when Kawhi's on the floor, Toronto has outscored Philly by 26 in the 32 minutes – that he has been on the bench, the Raptors have been outscored by 34 points and have shot 29%. So it shows you how important and what he has meant to this. But, Michael, what I want to ask you is, has the role of a Kyle Lowry and a Marcus Gasol, two veteran players who were all-stars, who were maybe you know not at the same level of height, and Kyle has had his issues in the playoffs. Gasol is a little older. Are they not getting the credit they deserve for where this series is? What role have they had in this series being 2-2, two, two, if if at any? I mean, or is it just more, nope, it's Kawhi? Well, I mean, they've been good in the wins, right? And, uh, you know, I think in Game 3 they were both terrible. So, like, I think Game 3 was, I think, fifth, Lowry's 56th playoff game as a Raptor. I think it was depending on which stat you want to use, it was certainly in his bottom 10 ever. He was terrible, and he knew it. And he responded with a really good, solid, very solid game in game four. That's what they need with him at the minimum. Um, and similarly, Gasol. Like, I mean, he, this guy is, uh, you know, sure, he's an all-NBA defender over time, but it's, it wasn't like he was – he was a number one or two option in Memphis on teams that went to the Western Conference Finals. And – you know, for whatever reason, since he's arrived here, he's been averaging about 7.7 shots a game. So I think the other night he took 13 field goals. I think that's the most field goals attempts he's had as a Raptor. And, like, listen, that's not a crazy number. So I think each of those guys, um, they deserve some pressure, I guess is the way to put it. They deserve they the expectation. I mean, that's $60 million basketball player between those two. So the expectation is that they can find a way to affect the game on both ends. And if they can't, then they deserve heat. So in two games, they've been pretty good, um, almost very good. In two losses, they've been kind of non-existent. So, uh, you know, I think that's a, a pretty good bellwether. Um, I, the one thing I am watching for, guys, is, you know, load management hasn't been much of a point of discussion in the playoffs, but there's been a lot of rest days um, in the first series and now the first half of this series. But now we're into three games in five days. Uh, this is the second of those. And I'll be very curious to see how Kawhi Leonard bounces back from what was, as we saw, a very tough, demanding game four um, with, you know, less basically 48 hours rest or thereabouts. So it's going to be interesting to see what he has to give tonight and if he can deliver it again on in game six. Of course, there is a two days off between game seven if it gets there. Maybe he'll catch gastroenteritis if he's been around uh, Toronto. Uh, Michael <laughs> right, right. Grange uh, from Sportsnet Canada. Real quick, uh, we talk a lot here about what will happen if the Sixers lose. they got three free agents. What is the sense? How disappointing would it to be knocked out in the second round? And what would the future – I mean, do they go into, like, full process, you know, to steal a page from the Sixers mode? Like, what – how disappointing and what happens to Toronto's franchise if they lose this series? Um, two different answers. One, it would be hugely disappointing. Like, you cannot underestimate, much like the Sixers, like this was an all-in poker hand that was played. Like, every chip has been pushed forward, um, not only with the DeRozan Kawhi trade, but um, Marcus Hall, Jonas Valanciunas, I mean, and, and DeLon Wright, those are really well thought of, highly valued players, and you went all in to go and get Gasol. So uh, the expectation is you're getting at least to the conference final and an NBA final. So losing, losing at this stage, even to a good team like the Sixers, would be a tough pill. I think it would throw everything in disarray. Like, uh, I think any hope, really, the Raptors have that Kawhi Leonard is staying kind of hinges on him them getting to a conference final, getting to an NBA final, really he can look around and go, you know, this is my chance to win another ring. Um, and then if he chooses, you know, to go elsewhere, then they're kind of a hybrid team. They can't really rebuild right away because they have Kyle Lowry on $33 million in the, in, going on the last year of his contract. 
Marcus All, everyone expects will pick his uh, pick up his option at twenty six million. Serge Ibaka going into last year of his deal at twenty million. So none of those guys I don't think are tradable unless you're going to attach young players or draft picks. And the Raptors, I think they're not in the business of doing that anymore. So I think you'd be heading into a kind of a hybrid season. I think they'd be a pretty good team. They'd be a playoff team, but it would be sort of a holding pattern before um, what would probably have to be some kind of rebuild. Uh, he covers the Raptors uh, for Sportsnet Canada. Michael Grange, kind enough to join us here on game day as the Sixers-Raptors. You can hear it tonight on 97.3 ESPN. Our coverage begins with Tom McGinnis at 8 o'clock. Uh, Michael, hopefully, well, we definitely will see you in here in Philly on uh, game uh, six. Well, hopefully it will be a uh, game seven in Toronto after that. We'll see how it all plays out. Thanks for your time, pal. Appreciate it. Thank you.